Hello and welcome. We're excited to have all of you here with us today as we share with you tips on how to go from being recognized as a manager to a leader in your organization. My name is Noelle Lochran and I'm part of Esri's marketing team. Today you'll be hearing from Ann Taylor, who is our tribal government team lead, and she'll provide some context on what you'll learn today in today's session. And then we have Adam Carr now, Esri's GIS evangelist, and he's going to share some of those tips and examples on how you can grow from a manager to a leader. So, Anne, if you're ready, I will go ahead and kick this off to you. Thanks, Noel. Hello and welcome, everyone. As Noel said, my name is Ann Taylor, and I'm the tribal lead at Esri, and I'm real excited today to have Adam Carnell, um, our Esri community, community evangelist, continuing our conversation around creating a GIS program that's impactful, sustainable, and successful. In the past couple of webinars, we've been focusing on the importance of having a geospatial strategy, of communicating with your leadership around the value of GIS and the benefits that it brings to your organization, and other important aspects of building a successful GIS program. So today, Adam's gonna talk about how GIS managers can grow towards becoming a leader in your organization and how that will bring even more benefits to your GIS program. So thanks again for joining us today and I'll hand it over to you, Adam. Great, thanks a lot, Ann. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you guys see my title screen? Yep, looks good. Uh, all right, great, thanks a lot. All right, yeah, so today we're gonna talk about the path from GIS manager to GIS leader. But before I can get started, I wanna interrupt this uh, normal presentation with the elephant in the room, which is the COVID pandemic. Um, and you know, this global pandemic is one of the major challenges that humanity has ever had to face. There are some benefits to our GIS community. You know, everything about this pandemic is spatial. You know, we've been thrust into the spotlight. Everyone affected by this tragedy is looking for answers and we're at the center of the area that can provide those answers. So now is our time to shine. And this is an incredible opportunity to be noticed and to advance people's knowledge and appreciation for what we do. So I want to look at some examples of how the community has responded. I'm sure you recognize this dashboard. This is perhaps the most visible map in the world right now. It's the COVID-19 global map and dashboard from Johns Hopkins University. And it was created by PhD student Encheng Dong in about eight hours. Uh, once it was publicly released, uh, it did, pun intended, go viral very quickly. And it now gets uh, consistently over a billion hits per day. That's a billion with a B. That's almost 14,000 hits per second. And it's designed to handle over 2 billion hits per day. And it's received over a trillion hits uh, overall in its, in its lifetime. Uh, they've also released a, a United States dashboard that provides more detailed information at the county level. And the impact that these apps has had is just staggering. I mean, I look at it as a watershed moment for the GIS community. There's the history of GIS up until this app, and then there's the history of GIS that will be after this after this app. And this app has just gotten an amazing number of people to appreciate the value of GIS and understand that we're more than just making maps. Uh, in fact, when I try to explain to people what I do for a living, I change it to say, you know, have you seen the Johns Hopkins dashboard? And if they say yes, and every person I've asked that to has said yes, and I could say, well, that's what, what I do. I, I, I work with GIS, which is the technology behind that dashboard. So um, the impact of, this, of these apps will be felt for a very, very long time. And um, let's just look at some of the impacts of that. First of all, back in February of 2020, this was a tweet from then acting Deputy Secretary of the US Department of Homeland Security uh, was asking, you know, is that app down? And it was down because it was going through some, some upgrades. Uh, but this shows, you know, the impact of this app and, and what levels of executives are, are actually using this information. Uh, also, in last year, uh, Time um, has their 100 most influential people of the year. 
And they tagged Lauren Gardner with that. And she's the one that runs the center at Johns Hopkins that created and maintains the dashboard. So big acknowledgement from time there. They also last year uh, released their 100 Innovations Changing How We Live, the Best Inventions of 2020. And the Coronavirus Resource Center from Johns Hopkins was on there as well. So really just an incredible impact that this technology has made. Uh, and you really can't even you know, figure out what the value of it is because uh, just the amount of, of, of other apps and that have impacted by this is just amazing. And let's look at some of the other COVID apps that have been produced. World Health Organization has a dashboard. U.S. Census Bureau has one. Uh, this is one you may not have heard of. This one's put out by Esri. It's called COVID Pulse. What's interesting about this one is not only does it show the daily numbers, the same information that you're seeing on the Johns Hopkins dashboard, but it shows the trend over time. So it shows on, are, th you know, are things getting better or are things getting worse? And you can zoom into each county in the U.S. Uh, and then not only does it show you the trend, but it also shows you the phase that that county is in. So every pandemic has six phases. Emergent, spreading, epidemic, controlled, end state, and no cases. And so you can see the trend for every county in the United States, but you can also see where, what phase of the pandemic that county is in. So really another great way, another data visualization providing uh, more detailed information on, on the COVID numbers. And the response to the jazz community has just really been amazing. Uh, Esri has cataloged, you know, over 380 apps that were deployed uh, in the U.S. and over 330 across the globe. So that's over a total of 700 applications that were deployed to help support the global response to this pandemic. And that's just a huge t testament to um, the GIS community and the value we're bringing to organizations everywhere. Pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, and then I'd like to highlight some of the apps pushed out by the tribal uh, organizations across the country. Uh, we've got the Seneca Nation, we've got the Yankton Sioux, uh, three affiliated tribes, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, the Tribal GIS, the Nez Perce, Sandia Pueblo, Muckleshoot, and the Cabazon Band. So. Kudos to anybody, whether you're in a tribal uh, organization or not, that has uh, used your skills and the technology you've access to to support the response to the pandemic. Uh, and one of the things I want to go over is there are certain things that these apps have in common, and uh, th these are really critical to understand. Number one, they're configurable. So they're, during a time where you have to deploy an application very quickly, there's no time for custom coding. So these apps are configurable. They can be deployed very quickly without having to know any you know, software development um, procedures. They're cloud-based, and this is critical too, because if an app's gonna go viral, which many of these public apps do, you must have the elasticity available in the cloud to adequately meet the demand or else it'll quickly bring your infrastructure to its knees. They're very user-centric. They're accessible to anyone. They work on any device. They're very data-driven. They're designed to showcase the data with visualization and analytics. And they're simple and easy to use. You don't need to uh, watch a video or read a book or take a course to learn how to use them. And you know, this is really the modern GIS recipe of a low-code or no-code commercial off-the-shelf configurable app that's powered by the geospatial cloud. And this has been proven to be the best way to provide valuable technology solutions in a short amount of time to a huge audience. And this is something that Esri has been preaching about as a best practice for many years now, and it was proven during the pandemic. And so I hope that those of you that are out there that push uh, apps out to large audiences are on this same page, that are you're using this modern GIS recipe to deploy the technology uh, effectively. And uh, I'd like to highlight that there are a lot more uh, COVID uh, solutions available from Esri at no cost, uh, not just dashboards and hub sites. We've got 15 total solutions. So if you work with people that are still working on the response to this pandemic in some of these areas, please talk to them and show them these apps and uh, see if it makes sense to go ahead and deploy them. We've also got apps for RTIS Pro on the desktop that actually do modeling 
of the cases to see where things are going. So if you work with folks that are that are need to do that, you've got two different models that are available to you. Um, and so kudos to everybody out there that's done incredible, amazing work to help battle this pandemic. Uh, you know, huge shout out to you and, and keep up the great work. But what I'd like to do is talk now about the COVID effects within uh, uh, organizations. You know, many organizations are now dealing with reduced budgets, which is forcing them to look for additional cost savings. They're looking to how can they can digitally transform their organization. And because a lot of people are still working remote, they're having to replace paper manual workflows, paper-based manual workflows. So executives at the top of organizations that are dealing with these things are looking to their managers to say, come to me with, uh, with ways that we can accomplish these things. How can we save money? How can we digitally transform our organization? How can we digitize these manual paper-based workflows? Well, we, we need them to know that GIS can do all of that. And so it's very important for all of us out there to step up and let our managers and executives know that, hey, if you're looking to do these things, look towards GIS because we can deliver on all of these things. And you know, even though budgets are being reduced, uh, normally in times like this, IT and technology budgets go up because they have to invest in technology in order to do more with less. So don't think that there isn't money available to help uh, you expand your GIS, uh, your GIS implementation. Okay. So that's the end of the, uh, the, the precursor to the presentation here in my acknowledgement of the COVID uh, pandemic and how GIS has responded to it and how we can um, utilize it. But now let's talk about this path of GIS manager to leader. Let's first talk about why we need GIS leaders. Well, you know, this is a watershed moment for me. About 10 years ago, I ran across this article online about the underutilization of GIS technologies. And this quote here, generally people outside of GIS think of GIS just as maps or graphic product of the younger brother of CAD really made me angry because while map making is an incredibly difficult skill and a valuable skill and maps are certainly valuable, if you've got access to uh, enterprise GIS, you should be doing a whole lot more than making maps. But this was 10 years ago, this was the attitude for a lot of people. They didn't understand the true value and potential of what we do um, and how it could help the organization. And then uh, back in 2015, this similar article came out and it said that GIS is often seen as maps or visual graphics product and the more advanced capabilities are ignored because it remain unknown to key departments and decision makers. And this and the previous one, I think a lot are still, uh, still true today. So we've got an image problem that we've got to shift away from. People look at us as map makers and we've got to get them to understand that we are solution providers, enterprise IT solution providers. And then this is from three years ago. This was a, a, a survey of CEOs asking them what were the challenges to um, um, getting more return on investment from their GIS investment. And as expected, lack of awareness among users and policymakers remains the biggest challenge for the industry with over 38% listing it as the primary hurdle. So the number one reason why organizations are not realizing the full ROI for their GIS investment is because it's lack of awareness. We've got to change that. And in that same article was this really great quote from the CEO of Here Technologies. And he said that the geospatial industry is still undervalued and underappreciated by the world at large. And so the onus is on us to collectively demonstrate how location data and tools can be applied to make dramatic improvements to society from making every journey safer and our air cleaner to helping businesses operate more efficiently. And he's totally correct. And the pandemic has helped with that, but we've got to keep that momentum moving forward. One of the ways that we can do that is by shifting the conversation. So let's talk about winning with location intelligence. The reason why I'm bringing up the term tech, um, location intelligence is because we've got to shift our communications with people away from technology and more towards capabilities. Because people at the top of organizations, the leaders and executives, usually aren't very interested in technology, but they are very interested in capabilities. How can we add additional capabilities to the staff and to the organization? How can we expand the depth of capabilities um, that we've already have? So if we can shift that conversation, we can draw the attention of managers and leaders. And the way we do that is by shifting it to the capability that GIS enables in an organization which I believe the best term for that is location intelligence. 
Uh, and if you want to, uh, after the the um, after you get the access to the slides here, it'll be hyperlinked to this video. There's a short video. It's about two minutes long. It's intended to be viewed by an executive. It was produced by Esri uh, in team with Fast Company, and it uh, defines location intelligence and explains the uh, the impact and the potential and the value of it to an organization. So it's a great tool to help you convince your organization's leaders about what location intelligence is and the value it can bring to your organization. So now that we've switched our conversation away from GIS and technology and more towards location intelligence, you need to understand that the skills required to implement a new tech, a new capability like location intelligence across your organization are different from the skills and knowledge it takes to implement a technology like GIS. So the technology part is the easy part, it's the people part that's hard, and it's that people part that separates your average GIS shop from your best performing ones. And so this document came out two years ago from Esri Canada, and it's one of the most important documents I believe uh, in my I've seen in my career for the GIS community. So I heartily suggest you download this, this document. And it's called Winning with Location Intelligence, the Essential Practices. And it's best practices that Esri Canada um, cataloged from surveying 200 organizations across Canada in all industries. And these organizations were fairly large. They had 500 or more employees. And then they analyzed their use of location intelligence and identified common best practices. And then what they did was they categorized these best practices into what they call the five pillars of location intelligence. So strategy, organization, technology and data, culture and literacy. And these are really critical. If you're gonna be successful with using GIS to enable the capability of location intelligence in your organization, you have to work on all five of these areas. You can't only focus on technology and data. So you need to proactively spend time and gaining skills in these other four areas and you've gotta spend time working on them to really make it as successful as it can be. So I'm going to go through each one of these five pillars a little bit closely, closer. But um, before I do that, I want to bring your attention to five numbers. I'm going to talk about each of these numbers in relation to each of the five pillars. And they are 64, 76, 78, 84, and 84. And you'll see how the data I've got by a survey of the GIS community are backing up the need for us to work on these areas. So let's look at the first one here, which is strategy. Um, and the bottom line is, if you're going to be successful with GIS and location intelligence in your organization, you must have a strategy. And I'm talking about a business strategy, not a technical strategy. Um, and the importance of a strategy cannot be understated. In fact, in a September 2019 survey from McKinsey and Company on how leaders in data and analytics have pulled ahead, they found that the creation of a strategy now ranks as the number one challenge to and the reason for a company's success at data and analytics. So GIS is data and analytics. And what this is saying is that if you're gonna be success, if you are successful with your data and analytics, the number one reason you are is because you have a good strategy. And if you're not successful, the number one reason you're not is you don't have a strategy. So you have got to have a strategy. And I know that it might seem difficult to get an executive's uh, sponsorship to spend time on a strategy, so I'll uh, bring you to this great article from Matt Lewin of Esri Canada. And this is five uh, reasons why and how you can convince an executive for the need for a geospatial strategy. So to unlock new sources of value, to strengthen a digital strategy, to enrich the customer experience, to establish a shared data foundation and because the IT strategy missed it. So um, you need to have a strategy and you need to be able to sell the reason uh, for the need of a strategy to your executive. And this is a great article uh, on that. And again, you'll get hyperlinks to these from the slides. All right, so we've got five poll questions today, one for each of the pillars. Now it's time for the very first poll question. All right, and there's the first poll question. Do you have and maintain a GIS strategic plan? Simple yes or no. OK, 
give it a few seconds here. A few more seconds, we've got a few more still coming in. All right, we can go ahead and close the poll. All right, thanks to everybody who answered the poll. Um, and here are the results. And it shows that 65% of you said no, you do not have a you do not have and maintain a GIS strategic plan. Well, let's see how that compares to the research that I've done. And let's look at my next slide. And sure enough, 64% of my research shows that organizations that use GIS do not have and maintain a GIS strategic plan. So across a couple of years and over almost 40 presentations across the US, I polled over 800 GIS professionals. And the five numbers that I'm gonna use in this presentation came from that. And you can see how exactly within 1% it aligned with your responses today. Hey, so, Adam. Yes. Adam, we see the poll uh, results, but we're not seeing your slides. Oh. So I don't know if we need to change presenter back to you. How's that? Uh, still nothing. Okay. Uh, how's that? There we go. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Ann. Yeah. All right. So within one percent, um, again, my my research showed sixty four percent. You guys did sixty five percent. So this is a real problem. So it's we're gonna you know really take you guys to the next level in our organizations and uh, empower location intelligence. We've got to have a, a strategic plan. And so. Uh, what do we? What is a geospatial strategy? So what it is is it is not a strategic plan that covers three to five years, and is you know updated every year or every other year, and it's a big thick document that sits on the shelf. In this context, a geospatial strategy is a business-oriented plan that defines how an organization is going to use GIS to achieve its goals. Again, it's focused on the business, not the technology. And an effective geospatial strategy connects your business needs with the right people, processes, and technology to help you overcome challenges and improve results. So it's totally focused on making the organization more successful. So another way to look at this is the process of creating a geospatial strategy is you first look at the business goals of your organization. What is your organization trying to achieve? You talk to the people in charge of meeting those goals and you find out what their challenges are. Then once you know their challenges, you can then propose uh, business-driven GIS solutions that help mitigate those challenge, challenges so it allows those people to reach their goals and the organization to reach those goals. And if you do that, ta -da, you get business value of GIS. So you see the common word in all four circles is business. This is all about the business. Everything you do should be helping the organization perform its business more effectively. And let's see what this looks like if you can pull this off in your organization. So let's look at an example of Bonneville County, Idaho. Uh, it is in the southeast part of Idaho. It's the county seat is Idaho Falls. The population is about 115,000 in the county. And back in 2015, they had a single GIS professional. And because they're susceptible to wildfires, they deployed some configurable commercial off the shelf ArcGIS solutions to support wildfire response. And this completely replaced their paper-based manual workflows that they'd always used in the past. And then unfortunately they did get hit with some wildfires. But as a result of this, the county provided a better emergency response experience to the end users than they ever had in the past. Now this, along with some other great high business value work they did, convinced management to let the county add five more full-time employees that are GIS professionals. So we all know how hard it is at a local government agency, especially one the size of um, Bonneville County, Idaho, how hard it is to get a new employee, full-time employee approved. This just shows you that if you provide strategic business value, you can not only get one employee, but five more. They're really uh, one of the most amazing case studies I've seen in my career. So here is how you do a geospatial strategy. Uh, number one, you understand, again, those goals and those challenges. Number two, you then plan the response. You look at what kind of technology, people, and processes, and data are required to implement a solution to help mitigate this challenge. 
you then act by implementing the solution, following best practices. And then we always want to revisit the goals and challenges at the top because they're constantly changing when things like disasters and wildfires or pandemics come along or what have you. So this is the simple um, best practice to a geospatial strategy that Esri has learned from decades of working with organizations, thousands of them across the globe in all industries. If you want to learn more about geospatial strategy, you can check out this document um, uh, at this URL. It's a short document and it will introduce you to this concept of a geospatial strategy and that best practice I just talked about. And then you can reach out to your ESRI account team to get more information on, on how to implement one in your organization. Okay, so on to the second of the five pillars, and that is organization. Now, organization is a very big um, topic. It's a wide range. So what I wanna focus on is governance. Uh, you can see the second bullet here, governance framework. And when I'm talking governance, I'm not talking technology governance, so no data governance or or any of that. I'm talking about organizational governance. So the structure of how GIS is run in your organization. So the decision-making process. So who does GIS, uh, how does GIS decisions get made in your organization? Like is there a, is there a steering committee and, and so forth? So do you have formal kind of uh, structured governance that says this is how GIS decisions are made in an organization that's got executive support, et cetera? So, our second of the five poll questions. If we can release that second poll right now, that would be great. So here it is. Do you have formal governance in place? Give me a yes or no here on this one as well. If you have a formal structure um, that helps make GIS decisions. We got hints. Uh, votes are coming in. Keep that going here. A few more seconds. All right, we'll stop it there. We can show the results. And sure enough, the results show that you've got 57% said no. So 57% of all of you guys out there uh, do not have a governance. All right. And so if we go back to my research, my research shows that 76% of organizations that use GIS do not have formal governance. So you guys are doing a lot better than my research shows. You show only 57%, so that's great. But those, uh, again, that's again a, a majority that don't have governance in place. If you wanna learn more about governance, I'd like to steer you to Matt Lewin of Ezra Canada. I mentioned Matt earlier as he wrote that article about how to convince your executives for the need of a strategy. He's published a lot on it. Um, he's got lots of articles and videos and so forth out there. Um, again, these will be hyperlinks. You'll be able to get to those. But it's critical that you have governance in place to really um, you know, ensure the success of GIS and location intelligence in your organization. All right, let's move to the third pillar, which is technology and data. Again, a very broad um, uh, category, uh, one that we spend most of our time in, and a lot of people spend 100% of their time in. You need to back off of that and spend time in these other four. But what I'd like to focus on here are best practices. You know, best practices are called best practices for a reason. They're collected via learning from other organizations implementing the technology, and they're designed to help you, prevent you from falling into pitfalls or making mistakes. Um, uh, and it's critical that you know about all the, you're aware of the best practices, the current best practices, and that you implement as many of them that are uh, applicable to your organization as possible. So what I'd like to do is um, open up another um, poll question, and that is uh, how many of you are familiar and have read Esri's Architecting the ArcGIS System Best Practices document? This is a critical document, one of the most important for you as a ArcGIS user. So it's critical that you're aware of this document and that you have read it and have followed it. So we've got the votes coming in. Wait a few more seconds here. All right, we can go ahead and close that poll. And that shows that 62% of you have, uh, have seen the, uh, 
have seen the document and have read it. So that's really, really great. Can we, can we close those poll results? Uh, I, I can do that here. Yeah, okay. All right, so that is much better than normal because my, or, uh, my research shows that 78% of GIS practitioners have not read the architecting document. So that, that's really great that you guys are much more on top of things. So for those of you that are not aware of it, this is the document, this is where you can find it. It is critical that you keep up to date on this document because as technology changes, best practices change. And so uh, it's, this document is updated at a minimum three times a year. So the latest um, edition is August of 2021. So just a couple of months ago, a new version came out. So please make sure you've got the most current one, review it with your ArcGI or your Esri account team and understand those best practices that apply to you and implement them accordingly. All right, under the fourth pillar, which is culture. Again, a very large area, um, large category, but what I'd like to do is focus on one part of culture, which is change management. And when I'm talking about change management, I'm not talking about software change management, I'm talking about organizational change management. You know, we spend a lot of time getting the technology ready for the organization. You've also got to get the organization ready for the technology. And so you've got to help people um, adopt the technology. And those organizations that implement change management programs, organizational change management programs, are six times more successful with technology adoption than those that do not. So people are averse to change just by, by default. And so we've got to make sure that if, you, know, you can deploy the best technology in the world, but if nobody uses it, it's not meeting its needs. So it's really important, again, to be successful with technology adoption that you implement a change management program. So let's go to the next poll question and let's find out how many of you are participating in an organizational change management, have and maintain a change management plan in your organization. If you can answer that one for me, that'd be great. All right, votes are coming in. Thanks to everybody who's voting. All right, let's go ahead and close that one. And we've got that 68%. They do not have a change management plan. Okay, well, that is still better than what my um, research shows, which is 84% of organizations don't have a change management plan. So uh, those of you that don't, then it's critical. And this is dealing again with that people problem. Um, and change management is the discipline that guides how we prepare, equip, and support individuals to successfully adopt change in order to drive organizational success and outcomes. And again, I've, um, research shows that those organizations that have a change management program and plan are six times more successful in their technology adoption. And if you need some assistance, Esri does have a change management consulting group, and we'd be happy to work with you on implementing a change management program in your organization. Michael Green is a part of that group and he's published a lot online and his team has, and there's some videos, et cetera, on change management. So if you wanna get connected with them, um, definitely reach out to your ESRI account team. Okay, so let's look at the last of the five pillars and that is literacy. Again, a broad category. So I wanna focus on one portion of that, which is workforce development, also known as training. Um, the GIS technology is changing so fast. It's really um, important that everybody that uses GIS in your organization get at least some training every year um, because we, we're spending a lot on implementing the GIS. We need to make sure that our staff are getting the most use out of it and that actually know how to use all of it that they have access to to support their work. So the best way to do this is to have a workforce development plan, which actually outlines based on the roles and responsibilities of the staff in your organization and how they're to use GIS, exactly what classes they need and in what succession so that they can best get the use of the technology that they have access to. And so it's really critical that you have a workforce development plan in your organization. So let's go to the last poll question, which is, do you have and maintain a workforce development plan? Simple yes or no, again. Right, votes are coming in. <coughs> this will be the last of the poll questions. I won't bug you any more on these. We can get a few more responses. 
All right, let's go ahead and close the poll. All right, and we can see that 71% of those of you on the webinar do not have a, uh, and maintain a workforce development plan. Okay, and that's still better than my research, which shows that 84% of organizations don't have a plan. And one of the reasons it's really critical to have a plan is that having a workforce development plan will make you more likely to get funding for workforce development. You know, if you go to your boss and say, I want $5,000 for some GIS training, they're probably going to say no. But if you have a plan that says, based on the roles and responsibilities and the access to GIS technology and organization, this is the training that our employees need in order to take advantage of that technology that we're rolling out, you're much more likely to get funding for um, your workforce development. So reach out to your Esri Count team. You have access to a training consultant that can help you put together a workforce development plan at no cost to you. We also have default uh, generic learning plans available on our work on our training website. So for instance, if you want a um, learning plan on how to help all your um, colleagues that are using our map get onto ArcGIS Pro, you can go up here and find a learning plan that will tell you what best courses will help you do that. So definitely make sure that you have a workforce development plan. Okay, so that's enough about the five pillars and enabling the capability of location intelligence and the best practices around them. You've been introduced to the five pillars. What I'd like to do now is focus on some GIS leadership examples. What I'm gonna do now is review some examples of people that are our peers that are part of the GIS community that are actually moving up and in, into these leadership positions have actually done it. And part of that is that some of them out there are rebranding their work. So uh, I talked about shifting the conversation away from GIS and onto capability like location intelligence. Uh, doing that can help shake the image of being a map maker. And so I'm finding that more and more organizations are rebranding their job titles and their departments and dropping the term GIS. And so here are some examples from across the globe of um, organizations that are doing that in order to get people to understand the true value they're bringing to the organization. And that makes sense because GIS is a technology. It's a tool we use. It's not what we do. So you don't see a spreadsheet department in your organization. It doesn't really make sense to have a GIS department. So the idea here is that if we can get executives to understand, like a CEO or whatever the top executive in your organization, to understand the value of GIS, that they will uh, create a position, a leadership position for us to move into. So as technology has brought more and more value to the organization, executives are creating uh, executive technology positions. So as technology got more and more important, uh, organizations created things like a CTO or an IT director or um, chief you know, information officer, whatever it is, a CIO. But as technology has continued to bring more value and get more and more complex, they're adding additional executive spaces, whether it be a chief innovation officer, a chief data officer, and a chief analytics officer. This is happening in organizations across the globe in all industries. So why not a chief geospatial officer? I do believe that if we could get executives to understand the potential uh, value that GIS and location intelligence can bring to an organization, that they will create a leadership position. And here are some examples of people, of peers just like you that are in our community across the globe that are moving up into these positions. And you'll see the rebranding here as well. You'll see examples from across the United States, uh, including Canada and Australia as well. So it is happening out there. People are moving up. Uh, and again, I would make sure that, you know, if you want to find out how these people did it, reach out to them on LinkedIn, get to the, know them. You know how friendly our community is. They're normally happy and proud to talk about um, how they did it and, and give you some pointers on how you can do it too. I'd like to highlight a few of them. Number one, this is Todd Shanley. He's the CIO at Cabarrus County, North Carolina, not far from where I am in Charlotte. Uh, and he's a great story. He started at Cabarrus County over 20 years ago as a GIS intern. So he comes from the GIS industry, is now an award-winning CIO, really um, doing an amazing job. Um, uh, here's another example. This is Nick O'Day. He's the chief data officer for the city of Johns Creek, Georgia. He was the GIS manager, but now he's the CDO. And then there's the advanced, uh, excuse me, there's the example of Tracy McKee. She used to be a GIS manager, and she's now the chief innovation officer for the city of Charleston, South Carolina. 
What I'd like to also show you is here are four examples in the local government space across the U.S. that maybe you didn't aren't moving up into some new uh, title and position, but this is another way to show the importance of GIS and location intelligence and organization is if they reorg and the GIS manager is now reporting directly to an executive because if you're providing a lot of value to an executive, there are a lot of times want to remove the levels of org chart between you and them and they wanna direct your activities themselves um, because that's how important it is. And so this is another way to show the importance of geospatial technology and location intelligence and organization is if they report directly to uh, an executive. All right, so now let's get to the conclusion and let's wrap this up. First of all, let's not forget about the five pillars of location intelligence, strategy, organization, technology and data, culture and literacy. If you're gonna be successful implementing a capability like location intelligence in your organization, you've got to find the time to work on all five of these things and you've got to get the skills and proactively get out there and, and, and execute on these. And again, your, RG, your Esri account team and our partners can help with that. And so that's the next slide here and that is get help. All of the most successful GIS teams that I've ever seen, none of them do it all themselves. It's too much. You've always got to get help. And I want to make sure you're aware of all of the help that Esri brings to the table. Number one, you've got your Esri account team, which is made of your account manager and your solution engineer. So hopefully you know those folks. You should be well acquainted with them. Reach out to them. They're, here, they're there to help you. Number two, Esri has a large stable of subject matter experts. So we have subject matter experts in every single industry. And so if you reach out to a director uh, in engineering uh, and you wanna help them mitigate their challenges so they can meet their goals with some business-driven GIS solutions, and you don't speak engineering and they don't speak GIS, talk to your ESRI account team. They can reach into ESRI. We can find some, one of our subject matter experts in engineering that can help bridge that communication gap and help get them to understand the value of, of GIS uh, in their mission. We've got a big services group and there's different ways to engage with them uh, in consulting services and retainers and packages. Again, I mentioned the training consultant earlier that can get you a workforce development plan. We've got that change management team. We've got award-winning tech support. We've got premium support available 24-7, 365. So if you're delivering GIS services to a round-the-clock operation, you might want to look into that so that you could have tech support available to you all the time. You also get a dedicated technical uh, support manager that manages every single um, one of your events, et cetera. And then there's an advantage program that you can subscribe to, and that gives you um, access to all of those things under services in one batch. You get a technical or you get a strategic advisor that will work with you on a work plan every year, and then you get credits that you can assign to those various resources to execute on that plan. And it's a really great way to move your GIS forward really quickly. Lastly, we have a great group of Esri partners out there. They can earn specialties. Be aware of those specialties, um, just because if you're looking for assistance in a certain area, you're going to want a partner that has that specialty, has earned that specialty, because they'll be a step ahead uh, and know how to help you out in that area. And then be aware of the ArcGIS Marketplace. That's where our partners uh, peddle their wares and services. And be sure to check that out. Now I'd like to review some resources for you. Uh, first of all, this is a really amazing book. This, again, comes to us from Matt Lewin at Esri Canada. Um, this is a collection of his writings on geospatial strategy. It's also the Geospatial Strategy Essentials for Managers. It's an ebook. that's free. You can go to this URL. Uh, and again, you'll get these slides, and there'll be hyperlinked to it. But this book really contains a lot of amazing best practices and advice and information on executing on this people side, this business side of GIS. And if you're in the public sector, definitely should be aware of this Smarter Government website and companion book. This is written by ex-governor um, of Maryland and mayor of Baltimore, Martin O'Malley. He's a really great example of a uh, public sector executive that understands the value of geospatial technology and location intelligence and how it can make an organization run smarter and make better decisions. Uh, so it's got great examples. Uh, and best practices that you can share with executives. I would suggest if you really want to convince an executive on the value of geospatial technology to help them make better decisions, buy them a copy of the Smarter Government book and give it to them. Uh, it's written ex 
expressly for executives and get them to understand with really clear examples of how um, uh, Martin O'Malley was able to do that uh, for Baltimore as well as the state of Maryland. Also, if you're in the public sector, uh, a great website to follow and subscribe to, you can get updates from it, is this Data Smart City Solutions website. And this comes to us from the Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And its director is Stephen Goldsmith, who is a vice mayor uh, in New York City and held other public sector executive positions across the US. And it again is outlines best practices, success stories, case studies, real world examples of how using data and analytics and geospatial technologies helps public sector organizations run smarter and make better decisions. So it's got podcasts, videos, all kinds of great stuff on there. Uh, I hardly suggest you subscribe to that. And then uh, if you're interested in uh, looking at this message from this presentation in a different format, I've published a series of three blog posts on LinkedIn. If you find me on LinkedIn and go to my profile, you'll see right away um, under the examples in my, um, in my profile, there's a link to this. So it's a three-part blog version of this presentation with hyperlinks that goes to all the, uh, all the other data I've talked about here. Uh, so if you'd like to consume it in that form, you can go check that out as well. And then um, lastly, what I'd like to do is uh, get you aware of some key people to follow out there that are really um, publishing some of the best content on strategic GIS. And they, they are Nathan Hazelwood, Matt Lewin, and Paul Sinot. Uh, Nathan is out of New Zealand. Uh, Matt, I've mentioned several times, is out of Esri, Canada. And Paul is out of Esri, Ireland. All three work for Esri distributors. That's not why they're on this slide, I promise you. They're out there because they're the three best people I've seen publishing consistently content on this business side of GIS. So follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn. They're on most of the social media platforms. Really, really great stuff. So now, since I'm an evangelist, it's time to inspire you. You know, it is time to seize opportunities in front of you. Your organizations are in trouble right now dealing with the pandemic. They need people like you to stand up and deliver. Um, this is what leaders do. In bad times, leaders stand up, ask how they can help, are proactive, and help lead the organization through times like this so that they emerge on the other side of these um, disasters even better than how they were beforehand. So there's a huge opportunity for us to step up, use the awareness that the pandemic may have brought to geospatial technology and organization, apply best practices, switch the conversation from technology to capability, implement location intelligence, and work on all five of those pillars, and get help from Esri and our partners. And the bottom line is, you know, there's a difference between having a job and building a career. Which one do you want to do? You want to build a career, you want to become a leader, you need to step up and help people change the organization for the better. And when you're gone through this job, you know, how will you be remembered? How will people talk to you? Will they, will they talk about the great things that you did uh, when times were tough and how you improved the organization as a whole? So please, what, um, you know, the real intent of this presentation, this isn't supposed to be just some great presentation or that you attend at a webinar. What it's really supposed to do is help inspire you to do more with our technology and help change your organization. And that's the bottom line for us as GIS professionals. We are here to change our organization for the better through digital technology. And so you really are supposed to be an agent of change. And I'd like you to take this information and these resources I'm providing and work with your ESRI account teams and our partners to make those differences and make our organizations and our communities a lot better. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much for putting up with me for all this time and for answering all the great poll questions. Um, please reach out to me. I'd love to, I'd love to meet users and help them any way I can and hear your stories and um, help, help uh, tell your stories, your success stories to others as well. So use my email address. I'm active on the Ezra community on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. So with that, I will kick it back to who's going to take over for the questions. I think Noel. Noel back. But, yeah, here we go. We'll talk about events first. Oh well, yeah, okay. Thank you, Adam. That was fantastic um, and very relevant. I think. Uh, well, here I'll talk about 
what events we have coming up. We've got a Esri Infrastructure Management and GIS conference. It's an in-person conference in Palm Springs that's happening next week. Um, in November, we have the Esri Ocean uh, Weather and Climate Forum, which will be uh, virtual. And you can follow those links to, to register for either of those. We also have, and you can go to the next slide, um, our next tribal webinar and last one of the year will be about leveraging ArcGIS to help bridge the di digital divide in Indian country. We're going to talk about broadband um, with a lot of money coming out through grants um, around broadband and the infrastructure bill that hopefully, fingers crossed, will get passed soon. Uh, we just thought it'd be great to kind of give you guys an, uh, more information on how you can leverage those grants uh, using ArcGIS to implement broadband. Then I also just wanted to remind everybody that, um, and I think with the follow-up email, we'll send out my contact information. Um, we do have a, a tribal account team, as many of you might know, I'm the account manager. Uh, Victoria Anderson is the solutions engineer and the training consultant is Justin Ogden. So um, we're here to help and follow up on uh, any questions you have. You can bring in Adam if you've got questions specifically around the webinar. Um, but yeah, as we said, we're here to help you guys be successful. Okay, questions. So Looks the like questions that were submitted are about the recording. So uh, tomorrow you will receive an email from GoToWebinar. Um, and that'll include the link to access the recording and the slides. Um, there was a comment, great presentation, Adam, you got me fired up from Jeff Sprock, and that's what was submitted. Excellent, thanks. thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for the comment, Jeff. Hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully we can help you do more with the technology in your organization. And again, anybody out there that, you know, after this sinks in or you digest a little further, if you need any assistance, please feel free to reach out to me. Any other questions? Uh, you can type them in that, that question box or just in the comment box also, the chat box if needed. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, thanks again so much for attending today. And we look forward to hearing back from you um, with any questions you might have or um, ideas that you'd like us to help you explore. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Noel and Raquel.